Hey YouTube, JP Dillon. This is going to be part two of servicing the Nico NR515 receiver. In the previous video we repaired the funky power switch speaker selector combination and also uh, created a way to stick the knob on a broken shaft which is doing quite well. So really now that we've fixed the disabling failures the only thing left is to service the unit uh, which consists of chemically treating the switches and controls, uh, maybe some light resoldering and replacement of the lamps, and then we can put it all back together and uh, see how well it performs after service. Now, probably the most interesting thing about this, being that it's a low-end model, is normally you have a service panel on the bottom. The whole bottom comes off. That's all they give you on this. They give you enough room to service the amplifier. That little area there is your power amp, and they figured because it was a low-end model you wouldn't do any high repairs to it, except the common thing of shorted output transistors uh, or just some light resoldering. I've already gone over that board, and there's no bad solders on it, so I'm just going to leave it as is and put the cover back on. Uh, but interesting that there's no serviceability on this from the bottom. You can yank the whole sub-chassis out, uh, but it's a bit of a chore. You really have to remove, you can see the screws there and there, and then in these little places like here, you'd remove all of these and the sub-chassis pops out. But it, because it's a monolithic board, it requires that you dismount all of these pots and switches from the front panel and pull it out, and it's just a nightmare. So if no servicer back when this was made would want to do that. They would just say, get another one. Uh, but anyways... As far as cleaning the switches and controls on this, these are very accessible. And if we peer inside of here, there's your volume pot and your switches and your selectors over here, that guy there. Uh, open back switches too, which are good and bad. Good in the sense that they're cleanable, bad in the sense that they get a lot of oxide. There's your balance control there with a center tap, which is kind of weird. And there's your tone controls, and then finally over here is the weirdo power switch speaker selector that we repaired. Uh, so the main point of access on these pots is usually the vent hole. And if you remember, we have our wonderful extension straw that we made from our deox can. And what we're trying to do is get the straw into the vent hole kind of like so yeah, there we go now you can see yeah you want to get the straw into the vent hole like that spritz and then work the control from the front back and forth back and forth and just do that about 20 or 30 times and then move on to the next one. Obviously, with the ones like the balance control here, accessibility is a little better because you can just literally spray it into the top uh, and then clean them out. But for the other pots, you want to go in through that little vent hole on the side there and then just work them. As far as the switches are concerned, where the plastic latch protrudes, is where you'd put your deox in. So as an example, we're just gonna get some down in there. You wanna use this on the lowest setting so that you don't hose the board with it. And then we're just gonna work it back and forth a bunch of times to let the cleaner do its job. And repeat for the rest. And obviously the input selector is very easy because it's got a nice open back there. And we can just go in there and then work that back and forth. So you get the idea there. So we're going to go ahead and clean all of our switches and controls that way. And then we can focus on of the lamps. 
So let's see if I can get down into this balance control here. Get back and forth. And we'll try to move on to these tone controls. Having this extension straw is the difference between you throwing the machine up against the wall and actually performing the task. Although depending on where your impediments are, like mine, I have a joint in the middle of mine that hangs up on things and that's why I'm kind of struggling with this one. But we can still get it in there. And then we've got this one over here. Come on. See, I keep getting hung up on the center section here where the wires are. If they had just made a really long straw to begin with with all these silly couplers on it. All right, then we can work the two tone controls. Okay, and then finally, we'll do our speaker selector switch that we fixed. It's a double-sided wafer, so remember to get it from both sides. And this one's a little tricky to turn. So what we're going to do is grab a knob. I bagged up the knobs here. Of course, the back doesn't want to fucking open. Urgh. Hang on. All right, so we'll stick our knob on here and work it this way. All right, and then lastly, the two switches we didn't get down in here. As a friendly reminder, whatever you do, don't get deox on your tuning condenser. You'll have to flush it all out and dry it off, and it's just not very fun to deal with because now your radio is not going to work with the crap. All right, so that's all taken care of. So now the next thing we need to do is replace the lamps, which is actually very easy on this one. You've got a screw right there. Focus, there we go. You've got that screw there, and you've got this one over here, which holds the lamp housing in. And once you get that out, those two screws out, the whole thing comes out, and it's really easy to change them. There's screw number one. Magnetic screwdrivers are a plus. And as you can see, you just pull down and away, like so, and there are your nice burned out lamps. Now just about all Nikos will use an 8 volt 250 milliamp year lamp, but pay attention to some of them, because some of them were 6 volt. So let's go ahead and pop one out and take a look, see at what it really is. Eight volt, three hundred milliampere. Now I like the two fifties instead of the three hundreds. I don't think these are the original lamps because these look like automotive style, but 
they might be. 250 is better over 300 because it runs cooler and you don't end up distorting plastic parts in front of the lamp housing, which given the distance, you probably won't on this, but it's better to be safe than sorry. You can do the LED conversion if you want to, but I sure as hell like the look of uh, incand incandescent lamps better than LEDs. Yep, nice. And on occasion you'll have one where the glass breaks it free. So get yourself a set of humus dots or needle nose and yank that out. And let's go ahead and pull the last one. Uh, there we go. Okay. Now, at this time, you may wish to crimp your lamp housings, or your lamp holders, just to give them a nice firm grip on your new lamps, which will likely have a lesser diameter barrel. Some of them do, some of them don't. Just going to squeeze those down. All right, now I've got lamps set aside here. These are the 8 bulb 250 milliamp here. We're just going to pop these in, assuming that my hands will cooperate with me today. Yes, the bench is a mess. It's always a mess. Everybody likes to comment on that. I only clean this thing once a week and I'm overdue. I thought this was going to take six or seven, but... Alright, so they're in. And now... You can see, or maybe you can't see, let's illuminate this for you. Down there behind the dial glass is a little tab there and a little tab there. And that's what these guys fit into. So make sure to do that as you're inserting it. And then the lip goes over top. If it would focus, there we go. And you're going to have to hold it there, or very likely you're going to have to hold it there while you get the screws in. So let's see. This is where the magnetic screwdriver is very helpful. Bear with me a second. Alright, so we've got screw number one. Once you get the first one in there, obviously, it will hold itself in place while you do the other one. And here comes screw number two. Alright, so we got our lamps in there. Now let's uh, turn it on and see what it looks like. That looks nice. Although it looks like we have some lamps that are still out. Let's see. One, two, three, four. Nope, they're all lit. It just has a weird pattern to it. Almost like it's burned out. It's kind of weird. Looking at it from the side, yeah, all the lamps are lit. Hmm. That is weird. That could be why they use the much brighter bulbs, but it's also an entry level set, so <laughs> it is what it is. Okay, so now that we've got this illuminated, uh, there's the problem with the stuck meter which I don't think I'm going to be able to fix, although there are tricks to that. Uh, what we can do is put a very small voltage on it uh, and see if it will swing at all, and if it does, what we do is we yank very gently on the uh, terminals here, 
while applying a little bit of heat to them with a soldering gun and see if we can unstick the bearing uh, to get it to move again and then when it cools have it cool in a place where it still functions. Sometimes you can rescue a sticky meter that way sometimes not. Uh, but let's get a, a current on it uh, and see what we can do or even better yet just put a strong signal on it and swing the tuner back and forth and see if we can get the the needle to move. Alright so we've got stereo but tuning we can see that it really doesn't move much at all. Uh, so let's grab a hold of one of our leads and give a tug on it and try again. Nope. Let's tug on the other one. No change at all. Yeah, let's go to AM so it will deflect. Okay, so the point of sensitivity is really the right side. It's looking from the back anyway. See, the meter's getting current because when I tug on it and I tune, it deflects either more or less. You see that if I tune one way, it wants to deflect towards the center. And if I tune back towards the station, it wants to deflect a little towards the right. Hmm, interesting. Alright, so I'm going to see if by pulling on this thing of sensitivity here, just kind of pulling on this lead while I'm tuning, if the meter deflects. See that? And if I let go of it, it doesn't tune back. So we need to yank on this a little bit and get the bearing to reseat. So the easiest way to do that, obviously remove power first. We're going to get a soldering iron and we're going to heat up that lead as we pull on it. And now we can see the meters reset, or maybe you can in the camera. And then I'm going to hold it back while it cools. Blow on it a bit. Now let's turn it on and see that helped any probably didn't yeah it did not now if I pull back on the left one it works and then it freezes up so let's try the same method with the left one it certainly seems to like to be pulled back on. It could be that this one's really not possible to fix. Sorry if I just bumped the camera stand there. Sure is trying though. It certainly is trying. I just need to hire an elf to stick inside of here and pull back on this lead. Alright, so the next step 
is to get a heat gun and heat the plastic body a little bit to see if I can get it to loosen up a little. Hopefully that'll do something. Alright, let's get some heat on it. We're going to do it at a distance. See if our meter center is... Sure is trying. Yeah, I'm thinking this one just might be done. not really improving anything oh well can't save them all so the next thing to do is to get the faceplate back together and then reattach the knobs and give it a final test alright so before you put this together it's a good idea to clean it up a little bit so it doesn't look so crummy. And that's as simple as just a Windex and a paper towel. In this case I use blue shop towels. And I'm just gonna, with the blue shop towel and the Windex, just kind of clean it up. Amazing how many of these things look so much better after you clean them. Don't forget to do it behind your dial glass too since a lot of the dirt accumulates there. And the top sides of it has them. And check for any smearing or smear marks streaking all right align your faceplate that's looking better already look at that Let's tilt things a little okie dokie In addition to top and bottom, there were two side screws. Okay, so let's tighten them. And one came out over here, but I have a spare. Get in a little more frame here. here we go. And let's get a screw up top. And we'll go ahead and tilt this up and tighten the ones for the faceplate on the bottom. Now if you're really brave, you can actually get some Novus Number no. 2 polish with the faceplate off and you can polish the clear coat on here too so that it's nice and pretty. But you got to be really careful because you could actually rub off the silk screening on a lot of these cheaper models and then you'll really be in a hurt. So unless it's really, really ugly and you're willing to take the risk, just usually the uh, commercial grade Windex and a blue shop towel is all you need. 
Now, as far as cleaning the knobs, most of these look okay. There was one of them here that was really scuzzy, like this one. See how that's really gross there? All that dirt and oil. Uh, you can get a, a toothbrush, and again, some Windex, and soak the knob, scrub it with the toothbrush, and that usually takes care of it, so just don't be afraid, just hose it. Let it sit for about 30 seconds. Wet your toothbrush too, which we'll go ahead and do here. And this usually eliminates most of the grime and grit. And as you can see, as I'm brushing it, it is working it off fairly well. See, much shinier and prettier. And we can just do this to all of the knobs we get. That way when you put it all back together, it looks fairly decent. No point in doing all this work and leaving the knobs all scuzzy. And there's no keeper on these. There's no click or detent. So I'm just going to tilt it up and point it towards the number 10 fully counterclockwise. And these ones, I believe, the smaller ones are the tone controls and balance and the very large ones, the volume and all that sort of thing. So again, just spritz it. Make sure your toothbrush is full of Windex and just go in a circular motion and clean all that grit and grime out of there. So to save you the boring part, I'm going to go ahead and finish cleaning everything up and then we'll, uh, we'll do a final test. Alright, so fast forward a bit and here it is back together. I think I am going to find some brighter lamps for it because I just don't like that spotting effect. It looks like one's burned out, but it's not. So, uh, brighter lamps may take care of that. <clears throat> but as you can see, I did pretty good with that base control being nice and flush. There's not a lot of wiggle to it. It works well. Uh, so, let's go over to auxiliary. Let's get the knob in the right place first so I know what it's pointing at. And let's see. Okay. Turn up my signal. And set my scope so I can see some stuff. And there we go. Nice clean sine wave. No more noisy controls. There's music there monitor switch isn't touchy, loudness isn't touchy. Okay, uh, so there is no bias or offset adjustment on these. It's all fixed component network. That there is your stereo separation. That's your FM detector. Uh, now, you're probably saying to yourself, well, how is he going to line it if he doesn't have a meter, uh, a working meter? Well, I can do it by ear or do it by oscilloscope. So let's turn over to FM here and get to 98.5, which is where my uh, generator is parked. And the oscillator is a little bit off there. So let's go ahead and bump over to 98.5 on the dial. And as we can see here, we've got distortion because the oscillator is not quite right. And they just want to use one of these plastic adjustment pots or ceramic trimmers. So we're going to do it, adjust it, and the phone's going to ring. Because nobody knows what business hours Call are. From Esparza, my turtle. All right, so that looks pretty good. Call from Esparza, my turtle. Okay, so let's turn the signal down until we start to get detector distortion there on the top. Let's tune one way or the other. Yeah, the detector's good. It's symmetrical clipping and distortion, at least. All right. Multiplex looks good. Now, what about sensitivity? Now, the radio on this thing is kind of 
it has a, a three gain condenser, but there's only one ceramic filter there, that's CF101, and then it goes over to the uh, AN217P, which is your FMIC. So really, if you want to figure out how to best tune the RF, uh, we're going to turn down the audio signal of our generator, and then I'm going to take an oscilloscope probe, and we're going to nestle it in here at the output of the filter, kind of like that. And let's see if I can get it on the input side, actually. And now that I've got it there, you can see on the top band here, as I turn the signal up and down, there's our 10.7 megahertz. So we're going to crank up the sensitivity a little. It's already pretty high. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust my RF trimmers on the tuning condenser and just peak that, assuming it will focus and be nice to me. So let's go ahead and peek all that out. I don't expect there to be stellar performance from this tuner. That one's really touchy. Now if you don't have an oscilloscope or an FM signal generator, don't do this. Don't just tweak it. You'll make it worse. Uh, but that's basically as good as it gets on the, on the radio portion of that. So the last thing to do is to button it back up, and uh, we'll conclude this. Alright, so she's all buttoned back up, uh, ready for some more use, and I think this will just hang around here and get played and uh, tweaked with. Eventually I'll do the lamps so that they're all a little bit better brightness. Uh, I think that's why they used all really bright lamps, was to co compensate for the fact that there aren't very many of them in there, and uh, to get rid of the spotting. But hopefully this was useful to you if you've got one of these for a similar Nico series on how to service these things. And uh, definitely that shaft control uh, repair there, that was an interesting task. But we got it and it functions. So uh, yeah, thanks for watching the video guys. Uh, more stuff to come soon and uh, we've got a couple things in the lineup. we still got the Sears Performance to get to, the dead GE color set, uh, and a variety of other things which I get to as I have time. And uh, we've also got incoming a 13-inch Emerson from about 1982 or 83 that's got uh, a weird vertical problem where the failure means that the vertical gets too big rather than too small. Usually it's the other way around, so stay tuned for that one in the future, too. More stuff to come.